Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom on this rather overcast July day. It doesn't really feel like July, although it is very warm um, and the midges are out, which is a sure sign that it's summer here in Highland. Um, this is going to be the second part in my polytunnel series this year, so I'm going to retreat in there in a moment and uh, show you everything that I've planted, um, how it's doing, both the good and the bad, um, and there have definitely been some clear successes and failures already this year. Um, I'm going to talk about the variety choice of the different plants. Um, I'm going to show you how I prune and cut back things. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the state of the art irrigation system that I have, uh, which might surprise you. And I'm going to show you my homemade liquid fertilizer, vital for getting large tomato crops. Forget the expensive chemical fertilizers that you see in garden centers. I've got an even better, entirely free organic alternative, which does exactly the same thing and is totally sustainable. There's only one catch. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. First of all, let me give you the grand tour. Oh, and uh, if you watch the first video in my polytunnel series this year, uh, which I filmed, I think it was in April, uh, then you'll immediately see how different everything looks in there. Um, it's now the very beginning of July and most of my polytunnel crops are really doing well, I have to say. I should say as well, I only really grow um, heat-loving plants under cover. So you're not going to find carrots or brassicas um, or beetroot or parsnip or peas and beans or even sweet corn in my polytunnel because they're all out here enjoying the lovely, reliable Irish summer. So the first thing you probably notice coming in here is this spider's web of strings occupying the middle section of my polytunnel, and that's to hold up my many tomato plants. And I decided this year to have five different varieties of tomato. Uh, there are three cherry varieties, Honey Delight, Shirley, and my personal favorite, Sun Gold. Uh, they're just the sweetest, most delicious cherry tomatoes. Then I have some money makers, which is a bit of a staple. You see them for sale in garden centers every year. Uh, they won't be making me any money though, sadly, as I intend to eat them all. Uh, and finally, there's some beefsteak tomatoes, which is a really chunky tomato, uh, usually used for making sandwiches. In previous years, I found that cherry tomatoes do better here just because they ripen quicker because they're smaller. And one limiting factor in Ireland is always that short summer season. Last year I made a critical mistake with my tomatoes. I didn't cut them back enough. So this year I made a promise with myself to limit every plant to just two shoots. I think many organic tomato growers take that a step further and cut the plants back to just a single shoot. I couldn't quite bring myself to be that cruel. Um, and I'm glad of that now looking at them because they're doing so well. Um, there are three things I think to be aware of if you're growing tomatoes, especially in a not so suitable climate like here in Ireland. Firstly, if you're growing them from seed, like I always do with everything, um, then you've got to start them really early. Mine were sown in late February. And the best place, of course, uh, to put the plant pots with the seeds in is a windowsill in your house where it's nice and warm, or better yet, in a conservatory. Secondly, uh, the more you cut back the side shoots, as I've already mentioned, the quicker the fruit should grow and ripen. And thirdly, they're really vulnerable to fungal infections, including, believe it or not, uh, potato blight. So ventilation is really important, especially under cover like this. And that's another reason why cutting back the side shoots really helps in terms of getting a good crop. I have to say, looking at this crop, um, I think I've really got it right this year with my tomatoes. In fact, as I mentioned in my Patreon podcast uh, a couple of days ago, I've already sampled a few and it's only the beginning of July, so that's a really good omen. If I can keep the fungus off for another month, that's the key thing, then I should have a bumper crop this year. There's one other thing uh, that you need to know about tomatoes, I think, and that's that they're very nitrogen hungry, which is where that homemade fertilizer comes in. More on that very soon. Now, those of you with keen eyesight may have already noticed that in between my tomato plants, we have strawberry plants like this one, uh, still in pots. Why on earth would I have strawberry plants still in pots at this time of year um, when it's past midsummer, I hear you ask? Well, when you first plant out your tomatoes, 
um, also your aubergine, squash, uh, that kind of thing, peppers as well. There's usually a period of about a month when the plant is still very small and surrounded by space, space that it will ultimately need to produce a good yield. Um, and that's between about, I guess, late April, early May and early June, which also happens to coincide with uh, when strawberry plants flower and start to produce fruit if they're kept in pots in a tunnel. So my strategy this year, and it's actually worked perfectly, uh, was to spread out my potted strawberry plants taken from runners from my outside uh, strawberries last year um, in between my tomatoes, my squash, my aubergines as I planted those things out, giving me an early crop of strawberries throughout May basically and into June. Uh, and what that's done is it's extended my strawberry season. You can tell I like strawberries, can't you? By about a month because my outside strawberries, and I have about 300 outside plants now, um, don't have ripe fruit um, until kind of mid-June. So I've been stuffing my face with strawberries um, every day now since the beginning of May. And I wouldn't have been able to do that last year without these indoor ones. It's now July. Um, and actually my outdoor crop now still has another couple of weeks of ripe fruit and there's even the odd strawberry that's come from kind of a second set of flowers on the indoor plants. Um, so I'm, I've been getting my fructose high every day and incidentally some of that fruit is going to be used to make a much promised strawberry wine video later this month. Then we have my aubergines called eggplant in some parts of the world. It's exactly the same thing. I grew two varieties this year. The first is my old favourite, the long purple, which is this plant behind me, creatively named. Uh, and it seems to do really well here. I had an incredible crop of these last year. It grows high, which I think helps with ventilation, and it flowers really early. You can see these are already in flower. The other variety, which is just a bit further along, is called Black Beauty, which I've never grown before uh, and it definitely isn't doing as well. It seems to be a smaller plant, um, but I'll reserve judgment until the autumn, as aubergine is quite slow growing. Uh, at least here it is. Next to the aubergines, and yes I am on my knees right now, we have an already overgrown looking bed of squash plants. And squash is quite tricky to grow inside the polytunnel because the plants just explode with shoots and leaves and of course there's limited space. So this year I'm reducing each plant to its main shoot and cutting off all the side shoots to try and limit that vegetation growth which later in the summer um, can cause a, a fungal problem and indeed that's what happened last year uh, towards the end of July and into August. Why not just grow it outside I hear you ask? Um, well, it's just not hot enough is the honest answer to that. The only member of the squash family which does do really well outside here is the humble courgette. Um, and you can see here in the tunnel, my single courgette plant already has fruit to harvest and it's the beginning of July. To the left of the courgette plant, I have pumpkin plants. Uh, it's the jack-o'-lantern variety and they're doing quite well. I'll definitely get a crop, I think. Um, there's already a few uh, tiny pumpkins forming, as you can see. But to the right of the courgette, I have my favourite member of the squash family, which also, frustratingly for me, seems to be the only one um, I really struggle to grow. And that's butternut squash. I much prefer the texture uh, when cooked to pumpkin and courgette, but it seems very slow to produce female flowers. I wonder if anyone out there might have some tips for me when it comes to growing butternut squash. This is the Chieftain variety, which is supposed to be one of the hardiest. But perhaps you guys might recommend um, a better variety, particularly for the Irish or the British climate. I'd love to hear any suggestions or tips in the comments. One of the best things about growing squash, I think, is that even if you don't get much of a crop from the female flowers, which produce the fruit, you do always get a bumper crop uh, from the male flowers which are of course edible and absolutely delicious uh, in salads or lightly fried with a bit of olive oil for a minute or two. You can eat most flowers of course uh, from plants that produce edible fruit, but the squash family produce particularly large and tasty ones. Look at that.
Moving on to the front bed, first of all we have some basil and I deliberately planted this near the door so that as you walk in you get that beautiful aroma. Um, oh it just smells so nice, fresh basil, it's amazing. Um, and I planted this quite late so it's a wee bit behind. Last year my basil was much higher at this period but uh, that's okay, we'll have a late crop uh, to make pesto with. Next we have my asparagus plants still in little pots as you can see and I actually grew these from seeds uh, earlier this year in the spring. Most people growing asparagus they buy cuttings and they just plant those out. Um, it just makes the process quicker um, for them to become established um, but I like to do things the hard way as you can see. Um, and I'm going to keep mine in pots as long as I can um, before creating a permanent bed for them both here in the tunnel and in one of my raised beds outside. It'll be interesting to see uh, if it does well out there too. But I really love asparagus, it's one of my favourite vegetables, so I can't wait to finally eat it. And then we have yet another plant which I've never grown before, but as you can see, it's certainly thriving here in my tunnel. Um, the seeds were actually given to me by a friend living in much warmer foreign parts, um, and I couldn't resist trying them out to see what happened. And it also has an absolutely delightful aroma. It's really sharp, almost like mint. Um, any ideas what this is? Well, this is chia, from which chia seeds are harvested. And I hope it's about to go to flower. It certainly looks like it is. I've been cutting back the side shoots to try and encourage it. And I've also been researching how to harvest seeds uh, later in the year, so fingers crossed I get a crop. And the final potential crop to show you is also sadly the biggest failure this year, and that's my peppers. I have four different varieties um, of bell pepper here, also known as sweet peppers. There's the um, Dulce de España, Yolo Wonder, uh, Robertina, uh, which is an Italian variety, and the Californian. And I planted these uh, more or less at the same time as my tomatoes uh, in late February, in my propagator set to 25 degrees. But sadly, they've just been very, very slow growing. As you can see, they're in pretty good health. Um, they look fine, but they look kind of how I would imagine they'd look at the beginning of May, certainly not the beginning of July. Um, I'm not quite sure what's gone wrong with them. As you can see, they have produced some flower heads, but as it's already July, I'm a bit worried and sceptical um, that it might be too little too late at this point in terms of producing a crop, certainly before the cold weather hits. So I know there are lots of very talented and experienced growers out there for some reason watching my videos. Um, and for any of you who've grown both tomatoes um, and peppers, particularly in a colder climate like the UK or Ireland, is there something that I should be doing differently in terms of propagating and caring for peppers versus tomatoes? Because I feel like this year the tomato crop planted at exactly the same time has done amazingly and the peppers haven't. And I'm not sure why that is. Most um, plants only need the soil temperature to be warm, but I'm wondering if peppers also need a high ambient air temperature um, to grow. If you know the answer, then please let me know in the comments. I read all of them. The final plant I want to show you in my polytunnel is this, my peach tree. Isn't it doing amazingly well? This was only planted uh, this year as a bare root tree um, in the spring. And already it's put on so many new shoots, at least compared to how it looked back when I planted it. Um, there were even a few flowers, uh, which alas did fall off, um, but that's to be expected in year one. And I am, of course, um, going to keep this tree pruned to the space available. Um, I don't want it uh, poking up through my polytunnel roof at some point. Now, as promised at the start of this video, it's time to introduce you to my state-of-the-art irrigation system here at Mossy Bottom. I showed you my water tank um, in the last video back in April and my electric pump, and that's connected up to this hose pipe. And I actually distribute that water using a very high-tech piece of kit. And here it is. Yeah, only kidding. Of course, it's not that simple. You need two. 
I'm afraid I've yet to install a real irrigation system here in the tunnel. But um, having water on tap, which I do have uh, like this, does make it quite easy to do by hand. And I actually think spending an hour every second day watering everything in your polytunnel or your greenhouse if you have one is a good way to keep an eye on what's happening and contemplate what jobs uh, need doing and what strategies need implementing. Um, to be honest, I actually really enjoy it. Um, as long as it's not too hot in here, it can get up to 40 degrees. So I like to do my watering either early in the morning or late in the evening. Finally, it's time to reveal this, which is obviously the small holder's equivalent of a witch's cauldron, except it's full of something much fouler than any witch could ever brew up. This is my liquid fertilizer, which at this time of year is made entirely from nettles, hundreds of them, in fact, probably even thousands of them. They're all harvested from my own land with these. <laughs> And one thing I'm often asked uh, is whether I eat my own nettles, turning them into soup um, or tea. And I can certainly say that I have tried uh, those delicacies, um, but when you grow all the delicious vegetables and herbs that I grow here at Mossy Bottom, you know, nettle soup, it, it doesn't sound quite as appetizing as, as, say, leek and potato soup or tomato and basil soup, or indeed uh, homegrown peppermint tea chamomile tea. You know, if I was lost in the wilderness and came across some nettles, I would definitely make myself some nettle soup, uh, which is basically the same as nettle tea when you think about it. Um, but on my small holding, nettles have a different, um, but I have to say, equally valuable use. In fact, it's a more valuable use. They make an even more delicious tonic for my plants than they would for me, if that's possible. So, of course, I couldn't possibly spare any for myself. All you do to make this delicious concoction is take some nettles, bruise them, break them up a bit, um, and add lots of water, preferably rainwater or spring water, uh, which is what I used. You don't want any chemicals in there. You then cover to keep weed seeds out. You don't want them blowing in, um, and also to increase the temperature, which is what I have this plastic sheet for. And then you just leave them in a relatively sunny spot to ferment for a few weeks. And what you're left with um, is a high nitrogen, uh, high potassium, high zinc, magnesium, calcium, um, all the major nutrients really, uh, liquid fertilizer, which you can apply diluted, of course, to your crops uh, as they grow. Uh, and the soil in my polytunnel has actually already had compost added to it this winter um, with my rabbit manure. So it was already quite rich, but this is a little something extra that really helps with early leaf growth. So for the first few months after you plant things out, uh, you can use this diluted and it will help the plants grow quicker. And you can incidentally also make a very similar fertilizer from comfrey plants. Um, and that makes comfrey, in my book, a super plant, on a small holding at least, because it's also beloved by pollinators, especially by bees. And it looks beautiful in flower, and it's edible, and it doesn't sting you, unlike nettles. Um, so by the end of the season, I will have drained all of this nettle fertiliser. I'll have used all of it. I'm using it every second day in my tunnel. And at that point, I'll fill it up again with comfrey shoots uh, and make myself some comfrey fertilizer ready for next spring. What's the tiny catch when it comes to this stuff? Well, have a go at making it and I promise you'll find out. One small tip though, do not store it anywhere near your house. Oh, that's just about it for this video, folks. I'm afraid I couldn't bend down anymore, so I had to bring moss up to my level for once. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed it. There'll be another video coming soon, uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, I love these long, warm summer days. I can get so much done, and I don't even have to wear gloves, unlike in the winter. 
Wherever you are in the world, take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. Say bye, Moss. Okay. There really isn't any space for you. See how narrow this is. No, go back, go back. Good boy. Good boy. I'll give you a stroke in a minute, just be patient. I have to say, uh, looking at... No, 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 you stay there. Stay there. You might think it's my doing putting all these animals in the shots, but it really isn't. They just stick to me like glue wherever I go. Look at this. One behind me, and the other in front. There's no space for you here, Moss. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I... What are you doing, Moss? Oh, look at what I have to deal with. Look at what I have to deal with. He's literally sitting on top of me while I'm trying to film this video. Ow. This isn't a bed. Do you mind? Ow! Right, that's it. Come on.